Hello, and in this episode, I want to look at the fourth ecumenical council of the church, uh, known as the Council of Chalcedon. And this was uh, held in uh, a place called Chalcedon uh, in modern Turkey in AD 451, um, called by the Emperor uh, Marcion. Um, all the bishops of the world, or virtually all of them, came to uh, that location to uh, thrash out and assert the true Catholic doctrine regarding the nature of Christ. Now, you may well think, well, haven't we all thought of this out before? But uh, there was a particular set of heresies, as they came to be known, um, uh, a whole bunch of them, which still were dividing the church and therefore causing instability in the empire, because, of course, by this time, the empire was officially Christian. And so there was very much a political need to ensure uniformity and unity of doctrine and not let this issue cause further division, as it had been, in fact. Um, and the council was focused on uh, a Christological question to do with the nature of Christ. So we know from Nicaea that uh, he is of the same substance, homoousion, as the father. Um, we also know that he's human, but in what sense do these two natures, these two uh, substances relate to each other? Um, and this is the, the problem. The Apollinarians, as we saw, believe that Jesus was, uh, as a fleshly creature, he was human, but his soul and his mind was divine. And other people uh, thought that uh, Jesus was a confused hybrid, a mixture of human and divine. But Chalcedon came to its own solution, providing a form of words, a language, which kind of gave a structure to their belief without really answering uh, why questions like, well, why did it happen like this and how does it work? And those kind of questions were left unresolved, perhaps deliberately so. Uh, they would probably say it's a mystery. So let me just begin by reading the council's uh, formal confession, which it agreed upon. In agreement, therefore, we all unanimously teach that we should confess that our Lord Jesus Christ is one and the same Son, the same perfect in Godhead and the same perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, consubstantial, that's another word for homoousion, with the Father in Godhead and the same consubstantial with us in manhood, like us in all things except sin begotten from the Father before the ages as regards his Godhead, and in the last days the same because of us and for and of our salvation, begotten from the Virgin Mary. The Theotokos as regards his manhood, the one same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, made known to us in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation, the difference of the natures being by no means removed because of the union, uh, but the property of each nature being preserved and coalescing in one person and one hypostasis, one being, I suppose, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, only begotten, divine word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets of old and Jesus himself have taught us about him and the creed of our fathers has handed down. Now, there's a lot going on there on the surface and indeed underneath, if you like, there's a lot of uh, implied rebuke to a whole bunch of other views, uh, Sabellianism and, and uh, adoptionism and Apollinarianism and Eutychianism and all sorts of stuff, which I won't go into. Um, but even though that form of words was agreed, and it's still the, the official teaching of all the main churches today, be it Catholic, Orthodox, Anglican, Methodist, you name it, apart from the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, it doesn't answer crucial questions and indeed has some slightly odd views within it. For example, it says uh, that Jesus was fully God and fully man. But um, so what does this mean? And he's one person. So Jesus has two wills, a divine will and a human will. How many minds does he have? Does he have a divine mind? Well, he must do because he's fully God, but he must also have a human mind because he's fully human. So Jesus is literally in two minds with two wills, which is slightly odd when you also claim in the same creed that he was like unto us in all things apart from sin. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't know anyone who thinks they are fully God and fully man. Uh, who believes they are the creator of the universe and is just like us in all things. That's not a being I recognize, I can identify with. It's a very strange entity. 
And also um, the Gospels as well uh, suggest that, uh, or state, uh, for example, Matthew chapter 13, verse 32, when Jesus was asked about the date of the end, he says, no one knows the date of the end, only the Father, neither the Son nor the angels. So this person, Jesus, who was fully God, didn't know things. Doesn't make any sense. God knows everything. It says so in 1 John that God knows everything. Another absurdity, perhaps, is the idea that God became a man for us and died on the cross for our, for our sins as our substitute. And this is the standard evangelical belief. But how can God die? It says God dies for our sins. That's the whole point. And yet the Bible repeatedly says that God is eternal. And it says in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and 1 Timothy chapter 4 that God is immortal. That's the word used, immortal. Immortal means does not die or cannot die. And yet Christian belief is that Jesus did die. So Jesus as God died. So again, there's a contradiction there. It doesn't really make sense how the immortal can be mortal that's a contradiction you so you can't assert one and then the other you can't assert god, jesus is fully god and then also assert that he will see uh, in matthew 13 that sorry mark 13 that he didn't know things it doesn't make sense also the uh, the claim at the end of the creed where it says as the prophets of old in jesus christ himself have taught us about the truth of the preceding statement i'm not aware of any prophets in the jewish bible who ever spoke of the messiah Jesus Christ being fully God and fully man coming to earth to die for our sins and being raised from the dead as far as I can see it never says that never hints at it and I'm not sure any human being has ever found that in the Jewish scriptures but that's what it claims it also says that Jesus himself has taught us this I don't I'm not aware of anywhere that Jesus teaches this at all uh, to be honest so uh, I, I'm a bit perplexed as to how that can be asserted in good faith um the other issues um coming back to the gospels for a second the idea that god becomes a man this is the incarnation of course and uh the, the creed attests that uh this is what jesus taught but if you actually look at the gospels say luke for example um uh, there is the birth narrative the nativity narrative where jesus is conceived in the womb and is born and grows up and if you look at chapter 1, verse 35, um, as scholars have done, and I'll quote some scholars in a second, Trinitarian scholars, by the way, of the highest calibre in the West, verse 35 says, the, and this is where the angel appears to Mary, the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. Now, if you know the Greek, which I do, and you, um, if you not difficult language to learn, to be honest, but if you could look at the Greek too, um, you would realise there's something slightly odd going on here. And I'll just quote from Jimmy Dunn, uh, one of the probably Britain's greatest New Testament scholars, just died a few years ago, Trinitarian. He says in his book Christology in the Making, page 50 and 51, in his birth narrative, Luke is more explicit than Matthew in his assertion of Jesus' divine sonship from birth. And he references that chapter it is sufficiently clear that it is a begetting a becoming which is in view the coming into existence of one who will be called and will in fact be the son of god not says jimmy dunn by the transition of a pre-existent being to become the soul of a human body or the metamorphosis metamorphosis of a divine being into a human fetus um so what we're talking here is the pre-existence of jesus the idea of the son becoming a human being what what uh, Jimmy Dunn has noticed in that verse is that for Luke, the son comes into existence. In other words, he's created, not just as Jesus, the human, but Jesus as such in his completeness. He comes into being. Um, there's another scholar who, um, let me just get this up, who in the evangelical word biblical commentary, John Holl Nolland, or Noland, uh, who wrote the commentary Luke, chapter 1 to 9 20 says this on that verse luke chapter 1 verse 35 the child is thought of as being holy and son of god from birth a child whose mode of origin is quite unprecedented meaning the virgin birth for luke there is a link between the fresh creative work of the spirit here marking the newly created son of god 
a choice not made out of the stock of human existing humanity. It was a virgin birth. It is made clear, rather, through a unique creative act which brings into being a child who would otherwise never have existed. So John Nolan recognises here in this evangelical scholarly commentary again the same point that Jesus comes into existence. He's created um, by the Holy Spirit at that point. So there's no sense of pre-existence in um, that gospel in Luke. The last quote um, comes from um, the writings of Raymond Brown, who was probably the 20th century's greatest English-speaking scholar. He's an American guy, a Catholic priest, who I had the, uh, the privilege of seeing lecture at the University of Oxford. And I met him before. I spent 20 minutes beforehand with him, actually, um, when I was a student. And um, we went into the chapel together, into the lecture together, and he went up on the stage and I went into uh, the audience. Um, and uh, he says on Luke one thirty five, uh, Raymond Brown, uh, he was on the Pontifical Biblical Commission, by the way. Um, so he was handpicked from scholars of the world, um, obviously as a Catholic priest as well. He says Luke one thirty five has embarrassed many Orthodox theologians since in pre-existence Christology, in other words, the Son existing from all eternity, a conception by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb does not bring about the existence of God's Son. Luke is, is seemingly unaware of such a Christology. Conception is causally related to divine sonship for him. In other words, the son, divine sonship uh, is brought into existence, is created into existence for Luke. And so I cannot follow those theologians who try to avoid the causal connotation in the therefore. This, he's referring to the word therefore in Greek, uh, which begins this line by arguing that for Luke, the conception of the child does not bring the Son of God into being. So um, here we have three eminent uh, scholars, uh, each of them a Christian, uh, Trinitarian, one Roman Catholic, two uh, evangelical or conservative Protestant, uh, looking at the Greek text, and I, I agree with them, that for Luke the Son uh, is brought into existence. Um, it's the same for Matthew. There is no incarnation in Matthew either. There is no incarnation in Mark. In fact, there's no nativity narrative. Jesus appears fully fledged as an adult on the scene, preaching in Galilee. It's only in the very last gospel, that of John, written towards the end of the first century, that you do have the sense of the word becoming flesh, as it says, and dwell, dwelling among us. This word is identified with Jesus. There it does exist, and that's undeniable. Um, but it is the least historical of the Gospels. It's one that's seen as the most theologized, the most interpretive, the most fictionalized, if you like, of all the four Gospels. Um, it's not really a transcript of what Jesus said and did, particularly regarding the I am statements, the I am the way, the truth and the life before Abraham was I am and, and so on. None of these public statements that allegedly were made by Jesus in John's Gospel found anywhere else, not in Luke, who apparently recorded all things, not in Mark and not in Matthew. They're seen as late creations and put on them the, the mouth of Jesus. So um, here we have this creed. I'm trying to keep it under 15 minutes because that's the limit um, that QuickTime Blair allows me, uh, which is probably a huge relief anyway. Um, in next time we will look, uh, oh sorry, about the four councils we've already covered. The four councils are seen as the most heavily theolog theological councils, the great doctrinal bedrocks of of the church's doctrine. The other councils uh, are less uh, fundamental, uh, although they are, um, in my view, very interesting, and I, I will, God willing, cover those as well. Um, and there we are. Thank you for now. See you next time.